Hello and welcome everybody. We will be beginning shortly. We're going to take some time to let everybody get into the room and I will give some announcements. Again, give me one moment and we will start going into the webinar. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today's webinar, Queering Environmental Justice, Unequal Environmental Health Burden on the LGBTQ plus community is presented by Leo Goldsmith. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter into the online Q&A box. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation will be recorded and made available on the Center for Occupational Environmental Health YouTube page. All participants who logged in with their registration email for their full live presentation today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation is completed, you will be able to access and print your certificate. Um, the presentation and any relevant resources will be available at that time as well. I would like to introduce our speaker, Leo Goldsmith. Leo has worked on projects such as consulting on an environmental climate justice mapping tool for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, provided logistical support for various stakeholders for the sustainable Upper Harbor Terminal Project in Minneapolis, and ecological restoration and community engagement projects at the New York Restoration Project. Additionally, his research focuses on how climate change and dispro can disproportionately impact the health of the LGBTQ plus population, primarily those with intersecting marginalized identities. His interests stem from his own personal identities as a queer, transgender Latino, and his passion for intersectional climate justice. Leo holds a Master of Environmental Management from the Yale School of Environment and a BA in Environmental Studies from Oberlin College. He is currently a Climate and Health Specialist at ICF and coordinates the Interagency Cross-Cutting Group on Climate Change and Climate Health, CCHHG, at the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Thank you for joining us, Leo. I'll go ahead and let you take over if you're ready to share. Thank you so much, Jess, for that really great introduction. And thank you so much, um, both to you and Tyra for inviting me here today. And thank you um, so much, everyone, for joining uh, this webinar today. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. And, right, and just confirming that you all can see this. Yes, we can see. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, so as Jess mentioned, my name is Leo Goldsmith, um, and I will be uh, talking to you all today about a paper that came out in the American Journal of Public Health um, in December of last year titled Queering Environmental Justice, Unequal Environmental Burden on the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so this was written uh, alongside with Dr. Michelle Bell, who is a professor at the Yale School of the Environment um, in conjunction with uh, the Yale School of Public Health. And so I wrote this paper with her when I was an environmental justice and health strategic initiative fellow um, for their environmental justice program when I was doing my master's there. Um, so kind of to give like an overview of how I'm going to uh, kind of go through this presentation, I'm first gonna give like an overview of LGBTQ plus populations, a little bit about environmental justice, and then kind of share um, the framework that we created um, in which uh, we are hoping that can kind of uh, jumpstart new research for LGBTQ plus communities and um, environmental health sciences and also environmental justice studies. Um, so first, starting off with the LGBTQ plus population. Um, so LGBTQ plus um, populations are extremely diverse uh, along lines of sexual orientation and gender identity. So that plus is very, very, um, expansive. So sexual orientations can include lesbian or gay, bisexual, queer, demisexual, asexual, pansexual, and much, much more than what I've described here. Um, gender identities can include um, transgender men or women. And so transgender is defined as um, somebody who does not identify as their assigned sex at birth. And on the opposite of that, um, so cisgender individuals uh, do identify as their assigned sex at birth. 
Gender identities can also include um, non-binary individuals, those who are two-spirit, which is primarily a term used in indigenous communities um, in North America, um, gender fluid, gender flux, agender, omnigender, and much, much more. The LGBTQ plus community is also extremely diverse along lines of race, age, socioeconomic status, um, immigration status, um, ability, and much, much more. And so, um, and those who tend to have uh, intersexual marginalized identities are disproportionately more impacted than um, those who may only share one um, marginalized identity. Um, and so that uh, theory is called intersectionality theory, which was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw um, to describe kind of the invisibility and the detrimental or the disproportionate impacts on Black women. And so to provide a little bit of um, kind of like the framing of our paper um, and a little bit of background on environmental justice uh, more specifically, um, environmental justice has historically focused on the placement of toxic industries and in communities of color. Um, it has also been expanded to include um, extreme events uh, such as hurricanes or extreme heat um, can include things such as uh, lead in housing um, and also uh, environmental smoke or tobacco smoke as well. It has also evolved um, to become what's considered critical environmental justice when it incorporates uh, women, indigeneity, citizenship, and even different species. And so basically through this review that uh, Dr. Michelle Bell and I did, we found that academic research, the extensive gray literature, um, and documented institutional discrimination through a variety of surveys demonstrates that there could be a link between unequal environmental exposure and the LGBTQ plus population. This is not something that has been uh, documented before. There's only been two other research papers that have actually even uh, considered that there could be a link between LGBTQ plus populations um, and environmental exposure, but only uh, primarily focusing on air pollution, which I'll get into later in this presentation. Um, and so we created this uh, framework um, to kind of describe some of the different pathways to how uh, environmental exposures um, could lead to, could either uh, make existing health inequities worse or cause um, health, health inequities themselves uh, through either uh, the geography and placement of LGBTQ plus populations um, or their exposure due to uh, um, cis heteronormative uh, federal, state, and local policies um, that could lead to um, either uh, lack of housing or um, housing that isn't uh, good for LGBTQ plus or for anybody's health, um, unemployment or lack of employment, um, and also uh, healthcare is not being able to access healthcare or not wanting to uh, go to see uh, doctors um, due to potential discrimination. Uh, there could be individual factors as well. So um, higher risk uh, due to different uh, factors I'll go into later, such as stress, anxiety, mental health, well-being um, that could lead to health inequities as well. And then how both the social institutions and individual factors can then um, either uh, make it more likely for them to uh, be exposed to detrimental environmental factors um, or have a worsening um, effect um, due to those underlying conditions when exposed to uh, detrimental environmental impacts. And so this next kind of section, I'll be going through, um, kind of like going backwards up through this uh, framework. So I'll be starting off with environmental exposures. So focusing on air pollution, uh, um, environmental tobacco smoke, as well as environmental disasters, and then kind of going into more of some of the health inequities that LGBTQ plus populations face. And then also at the very end, kind of going through um, different social institutions and kind of the discrimination that can occur within housing, employment, and healthcare. And then at the very end, I will be um, kind of describing some of the research gaps and data gaps, and then some um, policy recommendations towards the end as well. All right, so environmental exposures. Starting off with um, air pollution. 
So over 100 million people live in areas exceeding the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's um, health-based regulatory standards for ozone and fine particulate matter. However, uh, it does not affect every um, population or subpopulation exactly the same way. There were two papers that were done by a group of uh, researchers from the University of Utah um, that looked at um, where same-sex enclaves, which are defined as a higher number of same-sex couples living in a census tract. Um, so that was uh, based off of the US census data at that time. Um, and they also looked at uh, air pollution data and kind of overlaid to two to see whether or not there was a disproportionate impact for hazardous air um, pollution. And so what they found was that both nationally and also um, in Greater Houston, because they, they did one paper just focused on Greater Houston and then one uh, paper focused nationally, they found very similar uh, results uh, for, for both of those papers, which was that census tracts that had same-sex enclaves had a higher risk of cumulative cancer um, due to HAPS. Um, that stemmed from major stationary sources, smaller stationary sources, on-road mobile sources, non-road mobile sources, and background concentrations. They also found that same-sex enclaves were associated with a mean respiratory illness and cancer risk from 12.3% to 23.8% higher, respectively. And that sexual orientation, even when accounting for other co-founder confounders, sorry, <laughs> such as race, is a strong indicator that one lives in an area with high levels of HAPS. Um, and so the, these were the two papers that I was describing before that were kind of the first to even suggest that there could be um, a potential connection um, of detrimental environmental exposures and LGBTQ plus health outcomes. Um, there was, of course, limitations to these two papers because they were relying on U.S. Census data. Um, and so they could only um, they could only focus on same sex couples. Uh, which was defined as both partnered um, and married. Um, but it leaves out, of course, those who are single, um, bisexual individuals who are in opposite sex couples, uh, people who are uh, younger, and um, potentially transgender individuals as well. Moving on to environmental disasters. There was a paper that was written, um, uh, it was me, uh, Dr. Michael Mendez at the University of California, Irvine, and a PhD student at the University of Georgia, Vanessa Raditz, um, where we explored how um, climate-related extreme disasters or extreme events um, such as disasters could disproportionately impact LGBTQ plus communities. Um, in, this, in this paper, we outlined that the three kind of drivers of discrimination and bias within disaster response and relief um, stem from inequitable federal response, lack of inclusion of LGBTQ plus families, and also face-based organizations and the reliance on them uh, during a disaster. And so starting off with inequitable federal response, um, there is a non-discrimination protection um, for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, um, called the, uh, it's basically section 308 of the Robert T. Stafford Act. And what that act states is um, protections for those on the basis of sex. It doesn't uh, explicitly call out sexual orientation or gender identity. And so depending on the, um, whether or not you, uh, we're in more conservative administration or more liberal administration, the way that they could define sex um, can be vastly different. So in a conservative administration, they could define sex as um, you are the gender that you're assigned at birth and um, will prioritize heterosexual relationships. While in a more liberal administration, um, they expect like currently now under Biden, they have expanded it to include sexual orientation and gender identity to the full definition of those terms. Um, and so that can affect whether or not emergency temporary housing and shelter um, can legally discriminate against LGBTQ plus communities. Um, so for lack of inclusion of LGBTQ plus families, uh, policies do not and only, only uh, incorporate like biological or genetic relatives, but do not um, consider chosen family, which is 
uh, particularly unique to the LGBTQ plus community. And so chosen family can be defined as um, family in which you are not biologically or genetically genetic relatives, um, but it's still a, like a very important social support and network um, that is just as valid as uh, legal or biological relatives. Um, and so that led to uh, LGBTQ plus families having to um, pretend to be siblings in order to stay together within shelters. There were um, parents who were separated from their children um, because they weren't able to prove that they were that child's parent um, and much, much more kind of horrible stories that have occurred um, during hurricanes and also wildfires um, in the United States specifically. Um, for faith-based organizations, uh, they are the first responders for any disaster um, for very good reason. Uh, they um, provide, you know, shelter, food, water, medicine, and much, much more. Um, they generally are places that um, people in the community tend to trust. Um, and so there's been a larger reliance on faith-based organizations to kind of provide disaster relief and response before state and federal um, response kind of kicks in. However, there's been a uh, there's long history of discrimination from faith-based organizations, leaders, and politicians um, that uh, towards the LGBTQ plus community in which um, they discriminate against. So like, for example, there have been uh, LGBTQ plus individuals turned away from churches during disasters for uh, being who they are. Um, LGBTQ plus individuals who don't feel comfortable going to a faith-based organization um, for a fear of discrimination, um, politicians and leaders that have uh, basically um, blamed LGBTQ plus communities for causing the natural or the environmental disaster in the first place um, and much, much more. And this is not to say that the, all faith-based organizations are like this. Um, and there are plenty of faith-based organizations that are allies. Um, however, it's, it's still something to still look at and acknowledge that that occurs. So these are just some uh, um, news article headlines that have occurred. Uh, so there's one, um, there's some from like Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Maria, uh, the wildfires in California, um, as well as in Oregon. And so, uh, the top left one kind of talks about how uh, the Alley Forney Center, which is an LGBTQ plus homeless shelter, um, was destroyed during Hurricane Sandy. And there was about, I think, four or five months period between when that was destroyed um, in Lower Manhattan to when it was rebuilt in Harlem, that there was a, a, not a continuous, a, there was not, services were not continued during that time, um, was, which left uh, all of their constituents um, uh, in a vulnerable position. Um, there was uh, news articles about how there were LGBTQ plus bars um, shut, and community centers shut down during Hurricane Maria, as well as pharmacies. Um, and so there were many LGBTQ plus individuals that were not able to uh, access the medications that they need, um, as well as hormones, which are extremely important for transgender individuals. The out front, um, the wildfires in California article kind of talked about how there were LGBTQ plus use that had detrimental mental impacts um, due to the wildfires. And then the one on the top right um, kind of talks about how, you know, even through all of this um, talk about vulnerability for, um, for LGBTQ plus communities uh, that there's still, um, you know, for decades, LGBTQ plus individuals um, very much due to the lack of like federal uh, leadership has had to be resilient for um, a lot of things. And so this is something that LGBTQ plus individuals and communities have been able to tap into also during these extreme events um, and should be leveraged by uh, disaster um, uh, response and relief organizations. And then lastly, so talking about tobacco smoke and environmental smoke, um, the LGBTQ plus population have a uh, very high rate, will have a higher rate of smoking than the cisgender heterosexual population. 
So this includes homosexual women, bisexual women, and homosexual men, um, who are all much more likely. Uh, transgender men have the highest past 30 day use rate of cigarettes, e-cigarette and cigar use among the transgender population. And they're also twice as likely to use cigarettes um, and five times as likely to use e-cigarettes than cisgender men and women. Um, and so to explain why some of this might be the case, um, there was a study that stated that it could be minority stress, um, targeted advertising by tobacco companies and also gender stereotypes, um, which might explain some of the health disparities with cigarette smoking. And so to explain gender stereotypes a bit more, um, they were talking about how uh, smoking a cigarette was uh, considered to be uh, more masculine. Um, so that's why you might see um, from what I mentioned on the previous slide that trans men have very high rates of uh, smoking cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this figure on the left or on the right um, explains the minority stress theory. So this was developed by a researcher named um, uh, Ilan Meyer, um, who have been working on kind of this idea of minority stress theory for LGBTQ plus individuals um, since I think around 1990. So it's been a while. Um, so this one that I showed you or that I'm showing you here only focuses on sexual orientation. Um, he has since uh, done more on gender identity, but I haven't been able to find like an updated figure. Um, so this one unfortunately doesn't have that. But all this uh, says is that um, if you have a minority status, such as sexual orientation, uh, based on sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, gender, um, there are these internal processes that can affect your stress levels, such as <clears throat> expectations of rejection, concealment, um, so uh, hiding your identity and who you are, um, and as well as internalized uh, homophobia, as well as external um, kind of factors such as prejudice, um, discrimination, and violence um, can cause uh, negative mental health outcomes, but it also depends on how strong your uh, social support network and your coping mechanism skills are um, as well, because that can be a bit of a buffer for some of these mental health outcomes. Um, he also found that uh, the stress uh, that minorities face can also contribute to chronic illnesses. Um, but in regards to tobacco smoke, environmental smoke, that type of stress that is both internal and external, or, or those internal and external factors that can cause stress in uh, somebody um, who is LGBTQ plus uh, can create higher risk um, factors for uh, cigarette smoking. And there are also other factors um, that are not unique to the LGBTQ plus population that occur at higher rates um, that can also lead to higher smoking rates, which are stress, depression, alcohol use, victimization, and low socioeconomic status. Um, there was also a uh, uh, what was called the 2015 U.S. Trans Survey that came out of the National Center for Transgender Equality, um, which they're actually planning on um, putting another one out for 2022, which is exciting. Um, they also found that in the 2015 survey uh, that all of this uh, that I just mentioned was true for trans individuals as well, and actually at higher rates. Um, on the other side of this, um, LGBTQ plus populations also have a higher exposure to secondhand smoke um, or environmental tobacco smoke. Um, so uh, sexual minority men and women are twice as likely to be exposed in their own household to environmental tobacco smoke. Homosexual women are more exposed to secondhand smoke in the workplace. Um, and bisexual women are also um, exposed, more exposed in their own household than women in different sex relationships. And they also found that patrons of LGBTQ plus bars and venues um, had a 38% higher odds of being exposed to secondhand smoke um, than visitors of non-LGBTQ plus bars and venues. So that kind of concludes um, the environmental exposures and the review of the literature that we did. Um, so now I'm gonna be moving into health inequalities. Um, so first starting off with um, HIV, 
and then uh, moving on to respiratory illnesses and then uh, uh, some other potential factors as well. So gay and bisexual men are 55% of HIV cases, but comprise 2% of the population in the United States. And having an intersectional racialized identity is associated with higher rates of HIV. So CDC um, did a survey in seven different cities in 2019, um, and about 62% of the Black transgender women that they interviewed um, mentioned that they were HIV positive. Um, There's also a similar pre prevalence of HIV in transgender men compared to bisexual and gay cisgender men. And so how does this kind of interact with some of the other um, factors that I mentioned earlier, the environmental exposures? Um, so starting off with air pollution, uh, exposure to PM10, um, and nitrous oxide uh, was associated with increased risk for pneumocystis pneumonia hospitalization. Higher ozone levels uh, one to two months before hospitalization were associated with pneumocystis pneumonia. And colder weather, which will be much more prevalent in a changing climate um, uh, in terms of like polar vortexes and cold snaps um, alongside a high concentration of PM10 levels two weeks to 1.5 months before hospitalization were associated with pneumocystis pneumonia deaths in HIV positive patients. For tuberculosis, um, higher concentrations of NO2 and SO2 before hospital admission was associated with a higher risk of hospital admission related to TB. Um, Short-term exposure to those same pollutants also can cause hospital admissions. Um, and there's also been a study that found that there was a positive association between um, carbon monoxide and NO2 uh, with contracting TB, which both uh, TB and pneumocystis pneumonia can be um, can cause a lot of complications um, in some uh, in people who are living with HIV. Um, for cigarette smoking, uh, it was found that individuals with HIV were twice as likely to smoke cigarettes. Um, and smoking cigarettes also reduces the lung capacity to defend against bacterial pneumonia. Um, something that I'll mention later as well um, is that uh, there's really, uh, so trans masculine people tend to uh, uh, bind their chests um, in order to have a more, uh, what's considered a more masculine appearance. Um, and whether or not, um, and with trans men also having higher rates of HIV, there really isn't any sort of studies out there about how kind of like chest binding might kind of uh, interact with um, having like a, a lowered lung capacity while also having some of these other factors involved as well. Um, but just wanted to put that out there. Um, there's also a possible link between tuberculosis and HIV positive individuals and cigarette smoking that could compound with exposure to air pollution. And during environmental disasters, um, which uh, I just want to mention, I didn't mention this before, but uh, the 2018 uh, National Climate Assessment um, states that uh, environmental disasters are increasing in frequency and also intensity. Um, and so this will become much, much more um, needed to kind of address um, now and in the future. Um, so after a hurricane or major flood, so people who are immunocompromised um, aren't re cannot really go around anything that has been contaminated by floodwaters um, for because there's a potential that there could be mold um, or other uh, kind of um, issues with handling any of their belongings or going near uh, their home. Um, there's also uh, very little response for um, people living with HIV during environmental disasters, um, which was something actually that the US government has acknowledged um, that those living with HIV are affected by poor quality air, air and water and lack life-saving medications and lack access to health centers during natural disasters. Um, so moving on to respiratory illnesses, 
LGBTQ plus um, communities are at higher risk for respiratory illnesses such as asthma, as well as um, chronic obstruction, pulmonary disorder, COPD. Uh, Same-sex couples have had higher rates of lifetime and current asthma compared to heterosexual couples. And one study found that the risk of COPD was significantly higher for LGBTQ plus population, except for transgender men. And kind of coming back to uh, chest binding, um, there was a study that did find that uh, Chest binding can cause lung abnormalities, um, which was done through, uh, I think it's called a spirometry test. Um, so basically just uh, trying to measure how much uh, air the lung can hold and how quickly that they can blow air out of their lungs. Um, this was a very limited study. I think if I'm remembering correctly, there was only about 30 um, people who were included. Um, but so there's definitely, a lot more that needs to be done to kind of see if there's any sort of like interactions between these two. However, again, chest binding is extremely important for transmasculine people as well. So some of the other potential factors that we didn't really get to go into in this kind of review um, is cardiovascular disease. So LGBTQ plus populations have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease um, compared to cisgender heterosexual populations. Mm -hmm. And also um, queer women and transgender women have higher rates of mortality due to cardiovascular disease um, and also transgender men as well um, than uh, cisgender heterosexual populations. Um, something that I wanna point out for this is that uh, something that I've been curious about and thinking about more um, is kind of the interaction between extreme heat which is also an environmental justice issue and cardiovascular disease and especially if it's found that LGBTQ plus individuals are living in areas with higher levels of air pollution, um, which can be worsened by extreme heat, how that kind of interacts with LGBTQ plus population. Um, mental health was something else that we uh, only briefly kind of explored within this paper, but one in three LGBTQ plus adults experienced a mental illness in 2015 compared to one in five heterosexual adults. And one study conducted in Spain found that long-term exposure to air pollution can increase the odds of depression. And of course, environmental disasters have also been found to cause mental distress due to displacement, grief, uncertainty, loss of employment, food and water security, development of mental health disorders and isolation. Um, and so there, again, there hasn't really been, well, mental health and climate change ha and extreme events has been gaining a lot more traction lately. So there's a lot more reports that are coming out kind of on that subject. However, there's still kind of no uh, research done in that area for LGBTQ plus individuals. However, um, there's been a lot of news articles that have described uh, kind of uh, mental distress in English due to um, extreme events in, in the news. Um, so that concludes that section on health inequalities. And so now I'm gonna move on to uh, social institutions that can um, affect uh, health outcomes for, or that can affect health outcomes for LGBTQ plus individuals. And so the reason why we looked at social um, institutions is because uh, there's this theory in public health called social determinants of health. I'm sure many of you are uh, very familiar with um, but basically, uh, it, it just means that, um, so education access, healthcare access, where you live, um, your social network, um, and also your economic stability all have, um, can uh, impact your health. And so starting with employment, um, LGBTQ plus individuals are more likely to be unemployed compared to cisgender heterosexual individuals, and that's much higher for transgender individuals. The Human Rights Campaign found that 40% of LGBTQ plus individuals work in these five industries, which are restaurant and food services, retail, hospitals, K-12 education, and colleges and universities. And something that I wanted to mention is that uh, these five industries were heavily impacted by COVID-19. Um, and then two of these uh, industries are um, highly impacted by uh, what's called asthmogens. So 
um, pollutants that can either exacerbate or cause respiratory illnesses such as asthma. Um, so teachers uh, comprise of approximately 2 million LGBTQ plus individuals, um, and they are exposed to cleaning materials, dusts, and molds um, pretty much daily um, at work. Um, hospital workers, which comprise of approximately 1 million LGBTQ plus individuals, um, are exposed to formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, latex, muscle dopa, penicillins, and psyllium. LGBTQ plus populations are more likely to be uninsured than cisgender heterosexual populations. And it was found that 29% of queer women did not have personal doctors compared to 16% of um, cisgender heterosexual population. Um, one in six LGBTQ plus adults avoid seeking health care because of anticipated discrimination. And in 2015, uh, in the US trans survey that I mentioned earlier, 33% um, of transgender individuals were either verbally harassed or were refused medical care for being trans. Um, luckily, uh, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, um, which basically says that any organization that receives funding from the Department of Health and Human Services uh, cannot legally discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity as of May 2021. Before that day, or before that month, um, it only covered sexual orientation. And so this kind of goes back to how, depending on whether or not uh, we have a more liberal administration or more conservative administration, really makes a difference to um, LGBTQ plus individuals and their lives. For housing, um, the uh, two research papers that I talked about earlier on air pollution kind of outlined um, how there were um, heterosexist urban planning policies that pushed LGBTQ plus individuals into certain neighborhoods, um, primarily those that are uh, cited for unwanted land use um, because uh, kind of gay bars and uh, organizations and other LGBTQ plus organizations were considered unwanted land use. Um, and that could potentially be part of the reason why that they now experience uh, higher levels of um, hazardous air pollu pollution. Um, but it's also important to note that uh, primarily um, the white middle class uh, gay community has also been a uh, been a gentrifier as well. Um, and so just kind of acknowledging that some of these histories are a bit complicated. Um, and the Federal Housing Administration prioritized housing loans to heterosexual and married couples. Um, so the 1989 Harvard Law Review survey found that exclusionary zoning laws, restrictive statutory provisions, discriminatory landlord practices, and narrow judicial constructions of the meaning of family were found as barriers for um, LGBTQ plus people to find safe housing in heterosexual areas. Um, and then also uh, Federal Housing Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act um, now explicitly prohibit discrimination against sexual orientation and gender identity um, as of March 16th of 2021. Um, and then before then, uh, it did not explicitly um, prohibit discrimination because they also use the term sex um, and not explicitly saying sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, Same-sex couples still experience discrimination uh, when seeking mortgages. Um, and they also have, uh, so, so they tend to pay higher mortgages and they're more likely to be um, uh, refused uh, a mortgage as well. Um, so moving on to research gaps and recommendations. So um, a lot of the reasons why we have research gaps um, is because of the fact that there is no nationwide uh, population survey for LGBTQ plus communities. Um, the federal census survey, um, which happens every 10 years, and the American Community Survey, which happens, I think, three to five, every three to five years, um, does not collect info on gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, and they can, however, you can like retroact retroactively figure out same-sex couples for census surveys that were before 2020, um, but it's still, of course, very limited. And uh, there has 
been some methodologies on how to figure out maybe somebody who is transgender um, from those surveys, but it's extremely limited and uh, it's not very reliable. Um, the 2020 census is the first to acquire data on married same-sex couples um, that like outright asks whether or not they um, are a same-sex couple rather than having to like go back and kind of look through the data and guess and see who it would be. Um, and they also changed the term mother and father to parent to kind of reflect that. Uh, most surveys are either not randomized or have no comparison population, uh, which makes it very difficult to use as data. Um, and there are some federal surveys that do incorporate sexual orientation and gender identity data. Um, however, many of them, um, I think there's about nine or so that do. Um, it's a, on a state-by-state -state case, or, oh my gosh, state-by-state -state case. And so um, because there is not like a, a requirement for all states to gather the data. It's very much piecemeal, um, which isn't very helpful when you're trying to look at it in a national wide, uh, nationwide scale. Um, there was a uh, announcement by Biden um, during Transgender Day of Visibility. And also when he was talking about some of the equity efforts, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within the agencies where uh, he did mention wanting to collect more sexual orientation, gender identity data nationwide. Um, I'm not sure what that looks like yet or how that's going to happen, but that's hopeful. Hopefully maybe something will come out that can be used because especially for like um, environmental justice uh, look and also ex environmental exposure kind of research, needing that kind of population data is really important. Um, there are also some states that have gone further than what the federal government has uh, kind of put out um, for surveys. So California State Departments are required to collect sexual orientation and gender identity data, but um, that data is siloed among the different departments. And also, even if they do require it, um, there might not be a statewide kind of training on how to actually collect that um, in a culturally competent way. Um, here are some barriers to acquiring data on LGBTQ plus populations as well. Um, so the amount of sexual and gender identities can seem almost unlimited. Um, and so needing to have like a, a larger population sample for it to be considered uh, stati statistically significant can be quite difficult if there are many, many, many identities. Um, and so how do you kind of balance between wanting to respect people's identities, but also making sure that um, the data that you're getting is uh, useful as well. Um, and then also sexual and gender identities can be fluid. Um, so especially for those who are um, questioning or you know, people go through journeys with their sexual orientation and, and gender identity, it can change um, you know, depending on where you are in your life. Um, people who are gender fluid, um, it depends on when that can change and, and what context. Um, and so that can be very hard to capture as well in the data. Um, there can be issues with concealment. So people having to hide their identity or not wanting to share that identity because it could be dangerous for them to do so. Um, and also there are different ideas of sexual and gender identity depending on culture, um, which is why it's important to uh, collect not only identity data, but also behavior and attraction. Um, it's difficult to get high quality samples of a small population as I was kind of alluding to before. And there can also be cost barriers to obtaining sexual orientation and gender identity data. So some of the recommendations that we outlined in the paper, um, kind of going off what I just mentioned in the last uh, slide is to develop a system of collecting sexual orientation and gender identity data that is consistent and widely implemented that addresses the complex nature of LGBTQ plus populations and provides the means to research EJ issues within LGBTQ plus subpopulations, of course, in a very, in, in an intersectional way. Um, so not only singling out sexual orientation, gender identity, but also being able to include um, other identities, race, age, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, 
for uh, another recommendation that we pose is that LGBTQ plus, there should be LGBTQ plus anti-discriminatory policies within healthcare facilities, um, but also including like disaster relief organizations as well in response, um, and also cultural competency um, for healthcare workers, mental health professionals, um, and also uh, local state and federal government um, and uh, disaster response and relief organizations as well. Um, and uh, those should be in collaboration with the LGBTQ plus community and leaders um, to make sure that it encompasses everything. Something that I didn't mention here, but I do wanna mention is uh, also inclusive LGBTQ plus language into like climate adaptation plans and um, uh, emergency preparedness plans as well. Um, there should be more uh, targeted cessation, tobacco cessation ads campaigns towards LGBTQ plus communities. Um, it should be easier for, uh, especially during like in extreme events and disasters. Um, so identification documents should be easier to obtain for transgender and non-binary individuals. Only about 11% of transgender individuals actually have all of their uh, documents changed with the correct gender marker and also the correct name, um, which is, so that leaves 89% uh, of the population that doesn't have that. Um, and I will be uh, honest here, but I am also part of one of that 89% that still doesn't have that all changed because it can be very difficult depending on the state you were born in. Um, and so it kind of goes to show like, it, it's it can be very, very difficult to get those changed. Um, um, I already mentioned uh, disaster response and relief and also implementing federal, state and local non-discrimination policies. Um, but I would do want to emphasize that it really should be at the federal level. Um, it cannot, uh, for it for it to be part of like the states to kind of make uh, their own kind of, uh, to, to make it legal to discriminate against LGBTQ plus individuals is why we're seeing over 300 bills right now that are anti-LGBTQ plus um, across many states. Um, and it, yeah, it, it just, there needs to be federal um, human rights laws for LGBTQ plus individuals um, for housing, employment, and health. And we do have that so far for employment um, and just needs to expand. Um, and then also environmental justice research as well as environmental health sciences should incorporate LGBTQ plus individuals and issues as well. Um, and even like more so than that, uh, you know, learning about the histories, learning about um, LGBTQ plus individuals and language, um, that's really important as well. Um, but also uh, there really is always an intersection. Um, even if you're uh, looking at um, a marginalized population, uh, because I mentioned before that people have intersexual, intersectional um, identities that uh, you, you don't always, you, you wanna look at the, the issue in an intersectional way rather than just um, kind of taking out one specific aspect of that. Um, and then, so that's pretty much all what I had for my slides. I wanna say thank you again for being here and uh, um, listening to my talk. Um, I very much look forward to the Q&A and I don't know what time it is. I hopefully did not go over <laughs> too much, um, but I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, great, it's 3.50. Perfect, no, thank you so much for that presentation. And I'm sure that I can join everybody in just saying that there's so much to learn, so much work to do. Um, I wanted to ask if anybody has questions or maybe topics for discussion, if you can add that to the online Q&A box. It doesn't necessarily have to be a question, but if you have anything to add to the conversation or if you want to um, get any more clarification, we would love to hear from you and what you have to say. And I think I'll start. I know one thing that came up in my mind when I was listening to this is the research that I read, I think, last year um, in San Francisco about like the disproportionate number of like homeless youth that were from an LGBTQ uh, background. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, if you have any thoughts or, or feedback about maybe some of the ramifications of that from an environmental justice perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. 
Yeah, so uh, there's a statistic um, that 40% of um, homeless youth identify as LGBTQ+, um, which is just an astounding number. Um, there are a lot of different uh, kind of environmental exposure impacts that can occur for that population. Um, one of which I will mention is extreme heat, um, especially um, not being able, uh, a lot of homeless uh, individuals tend to spend a lot of time outside. Um, and uh, so it could put their, um, put them more at risk for uh, heat related illnesses, um, but not only that, but also uh, cold snaps as well, um, especially for transgender uh, youths and individuals. Um, it can be difficult to access uh, um, shelters um, based on their uh, the the gender that they identify with, um, and going to a shelter that is of the gender that they don't identify with can be very dangerous in terms of um, verbal harassment or violence that can occur. Um, there is also, in terms of extreme events, so. Um, uh, during uh, one of the ones that uh, the news articles that I showed before um, the headline for Hurricane Sandy, in the LA Forney Center, um, there were many trans youths who ended up uh, their documents were destroyed. Um, and so, as, as I kind of mentioned before, that's extremely important and extremely difficult to get for somebody who's trans, um, which uh, can lead to mental distress and also not being able to access medications. Um, uh, when the Alley Forney Center did get destroyed, um, there was that there was like a, a four or five months period where they're on the street, which can lead to a higher uh, risk for um, uh, usage of drugs or um, potentially other um, uh, events uh, that could be high risk for negative health outcomes. Um, and so it's just very important to you when kind of like thinking about environmental exposures to, um, you know, consider LGBTQ plus use, um, especially those who are homeless. But yeah, there's, there's definitely, I could go on about that forever, but um, I will, uh, I'll stop there. No, absolutely. I think it's such an important area of consideration. And I remember in the article, and I just double checked that it said that in San Francisco, upwards of 50% of those of those oh. um, homeless youth are actually, and I think San Francisco specific with the community that we have um, here has, you know, it's really seen um, like an, an influx in those numbers. And I that was actually pre-COVID. So I'd be really interested to know if that's shifted or changed and what ramifications that maybe the pandemic has even had on some of that um, environmental impact. Um, I have a question from the audience real quick. Um, are there any good resources with examples or guides on how to include LGBTQ plus considerations in workplace communications, particularly communications related to occupational health and safety? And um, I can expand that to say that um, with regard to our COEH, we do include that environmental um, health aspect into our occupational health because environmental health and occupational health are so closely related. Um, thank you so much for your question. Uh, there definitely are quite a few reports um, and guides for uh, more so how to incorporate LGBTQ plus language and uh, cultural competency on LGBTQ plus communities um, within like workplace communications and uh, the workplace itself. Um, there's less so on how to kind of incorporate uh, some of what I was talking about into kind of the specific work um, that someone might do for um, occupational health and safety. Uh, some good places to check are like the Human Rights Campaign um, and also GLAAD and uh, um, there's a, the Williams Institute at UCLA also has some reports um, that can be useful to, to look at. Um, if I'm not sure if there's maybe like an email list, I can, um, send those to you to like send out. Yes, um, absolutely. Tomorrow we will be sending an email out to everybody. So if you, um, just let me know, and then we will send out any resources that are relevant to this resource that I can get in, but we'll also host them on the website for future reference. Awesome.
Um, we actually have another question. It says, hi, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation today. I'm a master's student in the Occupational and Environmental Hygiene Program, and I really hope that the program starts to include discussions about the LGBTQIA plus community, particularly in the context of And I think Tyra froze. Yeah. Health outcomes. Would oh, you Tyra, have... can you go back to context, please? Uh, your computer cut out when you hit context. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Oh, sorry, your your um, internet cut out just for a second, um, but we heard you up to particularly in the context. Okay, um, particularly in the context of exposures and health outcomes, would you have any suggestions about how these findings could or should be implemented into education? Yeah, that's a really great um, question. I definitely think that uh, it there should be um, kind of more uh, lesson plans that should incorporate uh, these types of issues. Um, it can be difficult to kind of do so when, again, there's not really a lot out there on this, um, but I think even just opening um, the discussion in class or uh, um, even, you know, bringing somebody in to kind of talk about that. I did a lecture at um, at uh, Keith Western who in a climate change and health course because um, they were interested in having their students kind of learn more about how LGBTQ plus individuals might be disproportionately impacted by um, climate events. Um, but really it just starts by, you know, even if there really isn't much out there, just uh, starting to at least open up the discussion with students, um, starting to create like lesson plans, even just about, you know, some of the more um, kind of related issues around that. Um, so kind of what we did with our paper, you know, talking about like health inequities or potential environmental exposures or social institutions that could kind of affect all of those things um, and kind of learning about those. And that can kind of help kind of kickstart that as well. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that they need to think about more, but hopefully, hopefully that was, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I also have a question um, um, after listening to your presentation um, in regards to the recommendations um, um, that was talked about in your paper, which one do you feel is the most, um, the one uh, that the government or just other local entities can kind of handle the quickest or first, like which one do you believe is the one that could be done right now and fixed right now? That's a really good question. Um, I would have to say kind of that work with like cultural competency um, and really like incorporating um, LGBTQ plus languages, learning about histories, learning about, you know, the proper ways of like, for example, like, uh, you know, pronoun usage or um, uh, kind of uh, learning about different gender expressions, um, kind of understanding, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity, even as a cisgender heterosexual person, having those conversations are really important to kind of opening the door to more substantive kind of work being done. Um, but it really just starts with, uh, you know, learning and having discussions on those topics. And I think that could that's something that is, you know, well, I say it's easy, but in practice, <laughs> it's also, but it's definitely possible to do that, like, right now. Some of the other things that I mentioned, like, you know, collecting data, or, you know, some of these policy and laws will take a long time, but that really starts with people knowing and learning about LGBTQ plus communities and all of its diversity. Um, I have a question again. Um, what do you think, um, I guess, are the, what, what could be the impact of having a little bit more representation of people from the LGBTQ plus um, community in this type of research and really, um, you know, pulling from their, from their degrees and, and incorporating this type of research into their work um, from your own experience and something that you've seen? What do you think is the impact of that and how could we maybe increase it? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, what I've noticed is that LGBTQ plus um, scientists and researchers always tend to kind of think about, not not all the time, but um, a lot of the times tend to incorporate their own experiences into their work, um, and which 
is kind of how I ended up kind of doing this is I started thinking about like, I, you know, care about environmental justice and I care about uh, disproportionate climate impacts on certain populations, you know, how, um, but I didn't see anything with LGBTQ plus individuals and kind of wanted to explore that with other scientists, um, you know, kind of tapping into their experiences is really important. Um, and also queer and trans ways of, of doing that work, which I wish I could get into more a little bit, but um, there are so many queer and trans scientists that I've met that I've started to kind of incorporate LGBTQ plus in, uh, communities into their work, which just shows that there is really a need to have more diversity within the sciences and the field um, to kind of ask those questions or to even think of those questions because, you know, uh, somebody who hasn't experienced, um, you know, being queer or trans, uh, you know, of course won't know what to ask or that there is anything to ask. Um, so uplifting those um, scientists and also, you know, outreaching to LGBTQ plus organizations and, you know, starting with like mentoring programs to and pipelines to like encourage more LGBTQ plus individuals to kind of enter the field is really important. Thank you so much. Um, and as we're hitting time, I just have, you know, just one final quick question. And that's with regard to something that you were talking about a lot earlier on, and that's that intersectional approach to this, this topic. Um, have you seen any, um, maybe like the, the biggest, what is like the biggest takeaway that you found from like the intersectional aspect of this research when it comes to identities and experiences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think some of the biggest takeaways from that is that uh, it can be complicated, um, especially with the way that um, we have set up uh, you know, the ways that we're able to kind of analyze data um, where we need to have it into like neat categories to kind of see some of the stuff. And like, there really needs to be a scientific structure that's able to kind of incorporate all of those aspects of intersectionality um, in a way that can kind of see some of these like compounding effects. Um, like we know that they could exist, but uh, especially in regards to environmental exposure, but it's difficult to say how. Um, and so that's kind of the one thing that um, I've been thinking about a lot and I think was one of the biggest takeaways from this. Thank you so much. And again, I wanna thank everybody who was able to come by today. Thank you to Leo for all of the great um, information, the feedback, the responses that we've had. Thank you to Tyra Parrish um, for being able to be here today and supporting this initiative for the Equity and OEHS uh, webinar series. If you do go to coeh.berkeley.edu backslash webinars, we have upcoming webinars um, that are part of this occupational and environmental health equity series that we would love if you guys could come. Again, this is going to be recorded and posted online on our website. So uh, feel free to share this with your friends as you get the email tomorrow with your peers, um, any relevant parties so that we can continue to get the research out and, and find support for this type of um, engagement in our community and, and making the difference that we know we can. Um, again, uh, you will get an email tomorrow with the, uh, the evaluation link if you do need continuing education contact hours, and um, you'll have the recording, and I will definitely reach out to Leo today about any um, additional resources. So if that's it, I would like to say bye to everybody, and thank you again so much to Leo. Thank you so much, Justin Tara, and thank you again, everyone, for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.